If you're a landlord and you have a tenant who's been unable to pay their rent due to COVID or loss of income, join me as I speak with Robert Siska, who is a local real estate attorney, about what you can do. everyone. Welcome back to The Local Loop. I am so pleased to bring to you today Robert Siska. Hi, Rob. Hi, Joy. How are you? <laughs> Good. How are you? Okay. Um, great. And we are, today is April 17th, 2020. We are in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. I just wanted to timestamp that because things changed, Rob, as you know, um, on a daily, oh, yeah. hourly basis, yes. And, um, you know, I reached out to Rob recently because I have a lot of clients that are, um, you know, like people that invest in the stock market, they invest in real estate and they are landlords. Um, and they all of a sudden, you know, with gosh, 22 million people uh, that have filed for unemployment, there are a lot of people, unfortunately, who cannot pay their rent right now. So uh, we have um, people who are unable to pay their rent. And then we also have landlords that hold these properties and they also still have expenses. And uh, we were just talking about what their options are, Rob. Yeah. Um, so uh, thanks very much, Joy, first of all. And, it, and there's a lot of people that are hurting uh, yeah. in a variety of different ways, uh, whether it's a tenant or it's a landlord. And what we're seeing is, is people are just having a lot of questions. Yeah. Right. So um, last week, the governor came down um, with a order that basically stays the uh, starting of any eviction proceedings uh, until July 1. So you can't even start a proceeding. So people need to know, first of all, that the courts are closed. So right. even without the governor's stay, you're not going to get relief from the court because the courts are closed. Uh, I think that's an important thing to uh, everyone understand. When the courts open, this order then again gives people relief, gives tenants relief in that they cannot bring uh, eviction proceedings before July 1. There is also a uh, stay on April's rent. So tenants uh, who have not paid April's rent are protected uh, they have a 60-day grace period for April's rent. The May's right. rent, the May's rent is also has a 60-day grace period, but there's a couple of nuances there. The tenant has to reach out to the landlord in writing and let the landlord know that they've had some financial hardships. And I would advise tenants that have had some financial hardships to uh, be a little bit detailed as to what their financial hardships are. So can we go over that a little bit? Because I did have um, a client reach out and I told him that I was going to be speaking to you. Um, and he was like, well, my tenant said that he can't pay his April rent. Um, and his question was, can I ask him to dip into his 401k right now? Because right now there's no penalties. Like, can a landlord ask a tenant like to disclose what their financial situation really is like? Because you know, you want to wish that everyone uh, acts appropriately, but there could be some people that take advantage of this situation. Certainly on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and so to answer your question is the landlord can certainly ask that. Is the tenant required to disclose that? No, they're not. Not by law. Okay. Um, that said, what I'm advising my landlord clients and my tenant clients is in these uncertain times, the best thing to do is to try to work through the problem together. So that means continuous communication, transparent communication, okay. and to try to work through their differences, to understand where what the other person's plan is. So if you have a, for instance, a, a lease that's expiring, right. or people wanna show you know, they have lease expiring, the landlord wants to show that apartment. That's, you know, have a lot of those questions. Uh, so, about, hey. yeah, let's let's talk about that because a lot of leases are expiring in the next month or two. And typically we as realtors write in that 
we can start showing the property two months before the lease expires because we want to secure a new tenant or we want to put it on the market for sale. Are all bets off for that? Like, can the tenant just say, no, I don't want you to show? Unfortunately, the landlord does not have a way of enforcing that right now because the courts are closed. And that's so in in essence, yes, the, the tenant can say no. Mm -hmm. and the landlord can't do anything about it right now. I think when the courts open back up and uh, if this is something that happens, you know, later on in July, um, the landlords can certainly institute actions to sue for damages um, mm -hmm. at, a, at a later date and time. I think the important thing to understand is, is that there's not a court here that's available to settle everyone's differences. And what's important is that people work together right? right understanding people tenants have a valid reason perhaps for not wanting someone in but maybe the oh, landlord absolutely yeah but yeah. maybe the landlord can address those concerns in some way shape or form maybe the landlord can provide some sort of inducement for the tenant to let them in right so let's say you know, someone um, doesn't pay their rent and they have three months left on their lease. Uh, when the courts do open up in July, the landlord is still uh, entitled to that money. That was correct. Right. Correct. It's not like it's just going to they, they can just walk away from this. Right. Correct. And that's tenants need to understand that just because the courts are closed doesn't mean that, you know, they don't have an agreement. Right. They still have an agreement. They're still responsible for that rent at this point in time, right? There's not an order that says rent is free. It says the collection of it is deferred, but it's still subject to collection. So again, I'm encouraging people to work together um, and try to resolve their differences because if they have to go to court, it just becomes expensive and it becomes uncertain and I'm telling both clients, uh, both types of clients, landlords and tenants, that if you're unreasonable now, there's a very good chance that a judge will see that and mm -hmm. he or she will not look upon that favorably when it comes time to litigate a matter. Right, right. And so is this the type of thing that would be brought to small claims court or like housing how does, court. yeah, it, yeah oh, it's housing, housing court. court. Yeah, Got in, it. In Connecticut, correct. Interesting. And so, um, you know, I, I haven't done many leases recently, but I know a lot of people in Greenwich have. And we were discussing how um, it used to be so easy. We would just write the leases up. And now, yeah. now I'm like, oh, no, you got to talk to an attorney because there's all the COVID addendums and everything else. Can we talk about the new COVID addendum that, we're, you know, I've seen it. I've, I've done two sales recently where they've been put in. Yeah. Um, can you just talk about like who it protects and this, that, and the other. Yeah. Well, the the lease addendum um, and the contract addendum talk about what to do in the event there's this lockdown and that you can't get out, right? Because someone's mm -hmm. sick or at home, and it basically gives people an extension of time. This is one of the issues that we're having as uh, as a firm where we're counseling clients. They have tons of questions. How does this work? And yeah. ultimately, every situation is different. So it's important to tailor that language to the particular needs of the client, whether it's a tenant, a landlord, a buyer, or a seller. But it, in essence, excuses delay for a inability to perform is uh, is the simple way of looking at it. Now, there's a lot in there, yeah. but I, I think it's important that those types of clauses are added to contracts and to uh, leases because we don't know what the futures hold. I mean, two weeks ago, everything looked very different. Yeah. Three weeks ago, it looked different. And mm -hmm. three weeks from now, it will look different. In a right. month from now, it will look different. So what we're trying to do is just counsel clients and, and walk through the scenarios. Um, and, and, and the scenarios are as varied as you would imagine 
Oh, right? I'm they're, sure. They're all over the map. And and attorneys are really good at finding like the worst case scenario, you know, because that's your job is to protect yeah. the client, right? And I'm right. always like, God, how did you even think of that? But um, there are so many scenarios. It could be the tenant getting sick. It could be um, the the owner getting sick. Um, it could be the mover not being able to get there. Right. 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 I mean, it's just a number of things. It could be the bank delaying something. Oh yeah. And so let let's talk a little bit about that on the sales side because you know, um, yeah. on the on the COVID agreement that I've seen it it pretty much says that if if something happens, like you said, a delay occurs, then we have to be understanding of that. But I, I mean, I could, I, this, this is like a whole trickle effect where if someone's yeah. buying something else and then it, it, it affects so many other people's lives. Um, it, it, it absolutely does. And one of the added challenges that we have as attorneys and realtors is that many of the town halls are closed. That right. prevents us from getting a title search done as quickly as we would normally do so. Here in Greenwich, it's the custom to do your title and municipal search before the contract is signed. That's mm -hmm. not the case throughout all of Connecticut, but that's the custom here in Greenwich and what most uh, Greenwich attorneys do. Town halls closed. We can't get, um, we can't get the municipals. So there's now these contingencies that are being built in. And the question is, is, okay, how long is that contingency going to last? Right. right? Are, are we going to have a closing date where the closing date is before the town halls open? What are we going to do if we can't get municipals? Are we going to hold an escrow? Is the buyer going to take it the way it is? I mean, right. Again, these are all things that really need to be discussed up front. So mm -hmm. you don't you, you we you don't have these uh, decisions made for you by time and the inability to make a decision a month from now and say, hey, you know, I've already invested in moving my family into this house. Right. Right. I mean, so you want to you want to think about those things up front. And on the leasing uh, standpoint, I think it's important that realtors understand that they need to be thinking about that as they're uh, addressing their clients and addressing their clients concerns and to not draft that language themselves. I mean, you yeah. guys have a job for a reason, right? right. So, so do I. Right? <laughs> yes, yes. Right? So do the attorney. So, I mean, we, we have to work together to, to address those concerns. And absolutely. You know, yeah. And it's, and it's, you know, realtors really uh, are actually prohibited by law from doing anything other than filling in the blanks on a, on a lease. Yeah. It, and it's it's interesting because I, I know in other states they even write the contracts and I'm like, oh my yeah. God, I would never over a contract of sale. I would never want to go near that. So yeah. Yeah. In, in, in Connecticut, it's not like uh, not dislike other states in that there's local customs that are followed. So the custom in lower Fairfield County and mm -hmm. lower New York is that the attorneys draft the contract. Right. And we don't have binders. Parts, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. in, in different parts of, of the state, um, New York and Connecticut, the realtors are drafting the contract. Right. Right. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So any advice, final advice for landlords that are kind of dealing with this this problem of, of tenants not paying their full rent um, and trying to figure out if, you know, it's it's also difficult for us marketing properties where we think tenants are going to be leaving on X date and then leases are being written, say, for a week later. And what if what if the house isn't vacated? Yeah, I, I, I think um, in talking to landlords, what I find is where do you want to end up? Where does the landlord want to end up? Let's focus on what the goal of the client is and then work back towards the beginning to where we are today understanding that we don't have a crystal ball. No one's got a crystal ball. And I think what happens is, is every situation is really unique mm -hmm. and understanding, you know, what's, in, what's most important to the landlord right now. And can that change? And then really what it comes back to is the communication, right. developing a rapport with the tenant. If one isn't there, 
understanding what the tenant's plans are, what the tenant's concerns are, and then trying to come to a solution that works for all parties. And it is, you know, Joy, there's there's not a remedy for every for every claim here, yeah. right? And, and, yeah. and especially with the courts being closed, it's really important that parties work together. And to be uh, honest with you, what I've seen is that parties are willing to work together. Yeah, and that's it, great. Yeah, it, it is good. It it is um, a silver lining that I'm seeing coming out of this uh, is that parties are working together, and that's good. That's yeah. good. Hope, I hope that carries over. <laughs> yeah. So I guess what I'm hearing from you is is basically communication is key. So in that scenario that I just laid out, where someone has um, say a house where the lease is ending end of June, they want to rent mm -hmm. it for July first. You would recommend that they wouldn't even sign the lease for July 1st until they have serious communication with the present tenant who's there right now. Yeah, absolutely. Because if they can't perform on right. July 1, then they've created another issue. Right, right. Right. They okay. have to get out of one situation and get into another. But if they can't get into another situation and they're prevented from doing so, that becomes now two, two legal issues that they have. Yeah. And yeah. so, again, I think it's just about talking it through. Um, and with a, the realtor, with an attorney and drafting language. And, and then of course, um, uh, talking with the, the other party, whether you're a yeah. tenant or, um, or a landlord. And, you know, what we're seeing is some pretty innovative, uh, solutions to problems. Yeah. Uh, people are saying, you know, I have a lease that's expiring and people don't want to move right now. And so where there wasn't an agreement to um, extend the lease. So people are extending the lease. They're changing, you know, maybe the rental amount as an inducement to extend the lease, maybe give right. a month rent free or a reduced rent. Or in some instances, the rent, I've seen the yeah. rent the rent going up. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And so like, oh, you want to stay and you don't want to move during this time. Okay. That's fine. Right. We'll, we'll extend your lease, but the rent's now going to be this. Yeah. One final thing, because I know we talked about this a few days ago, was um, you had said that the communication between the landlord and the tenant should really be documented, too, because yes. who knows, yeah. they might need to go to um, housing court in July, and they're going to want to be able to reference this. And, and you and I had talked about even using technology and doing something like this, using StreamYard or Zoom to document your conversation with the tenant. So. Correct. Yeah. I think that's important. So, uh, as you know, Joy, I'm not a litigator. I'm more of a transactional attorney, but I have a lot of communication with my colleagues that are litigators. Yeah. And I think it's important. You know, one of the things that we stress is that the telephone is not the same as a Zoom call, is not mm -hmm. the same as in person or a text or an email. All right. of those things are not interchangeable, and there's a right form of communication for each situation. That said, we can't be in person really much anymore, I right? Know. And yeah. that's why we're doing something like this. Yeah. That notwithstanding, I think the cho the choice of the communication is important, but then making a contemporaneous note of what was in that communication is also important. So whether that's sending a follow-up email, hey, this is what we discussed, just right. want to, you know, make sure that we're on the same page. This pen to paper. Right. 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 That's great. Okay. Yeah. This has been so helpful, Robert. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad pleasure, that you're Joy. healthy and safe. I hope you stay that way. And yeah, knock on wood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I hope to see you um, in real life soon. So yeah, thank likewise. you again. This is great information for everyone. Great. Thanks, okay. Joy. Have a nice weekend. See you later. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.